is around the, the room, a uh, few new members. Um, uh, my name is Anjan Bose, and I represent Ekpati, the chair of the coalition. Um, just a very quick update about why we are here. Uh, this is a uh, permanent platform that we have managed to secure to advance our work at this very big uh, policy uh, discussions that uh, is happening uh, on internet governance. And this gives us a space uh, to talk, to bring the child protection issues, uh, the challenges, and also to share our initiatives uh, with a much um, higher and global uh, audience. Um, usually, we go around the room and introduce each other, but we decided not to do it this time because everybody knows each other. Uh, but having said that, I would take the liberty to uh, introduce uh, three of our new members. Um, we have um, over there at the back, please, if you can raise your hand, uh, the representatives from uh, the Alana and Madeline Foundation. And uh, they're represented by uh, Judith. Um, I don't know if I pronounce your last name. Is it Mokombo? Uh, OK, sorry. I, I got the, the spelling is not very clear here. Uh, and then the general manager for programs, Fiona McIntosh, and um, the cyber safety specialist, uh, Jeremy Blackman. And um, so they are um, a very new uh, member to our coalition, uh, just joined. Uh, we also have a representative from uh, DISC Foundation who is probably attending another uh, workshop at the same time. I just forgot to mention, um, we have a few members who are missing from uh, the room today just because of the, the scheduling of IGF didn't allow the, this participation, you know, because uh, there is another uh, cyber, you know, child and youth participation online safety workshop happening, uh, which they are either panelists or uh, need to attend. So it's a pity, but that's how it is. Um, but having said that, um, I would um, just give you a very, very quick introduction of um, uh, what we are going to do uh, for the session today. Uh, unlike previous years where we do a lot of information sharing, information exchange, uh, sharing good practices and initiatives, which we still try to allude to at the beginning uh, in terms of what our members do and see as challenge through the course of their work. Uh, this year we have decided to focus um, on child sexual abuse materials. And why did we do that? How we are going to, what we are going to do, I will um, allow um, Mr. John Carr, uh, who you all know is the leading expert on child online safety issues, and he has joined um, ECPAT International as um, our global advisor on uh, child online safety, and uh, he will lead that session on what we want to do on uh, child sexual abuse materials and how what, what are our propositions in terms of developing indicators, why we are trying to do that. It will be an open discussion. Leading to that as a prop that leads us to that discussion, uh, we have uh, three presentations today. Um, on my left, I just want to introduce you to the panelists. Uh, we have Susie Hargreaves from the Internet Watch Foundation. Um, we have Mr. Russell Chadwick from InHope. And we have on my right um, Bindu Sharma from ICMEC, uh, who is based in uh, Singapore. Uh, it's the East Asia Pacific ver segment of ICMEC, if or uh, yeah, it's Asia Pacific uh, version of the ICMEC. And she will, they, they will be presenting their work in relation to child sexual abuse materials that fits in the context of our core discussions today. But uh, as I said before, I just wanted to give you a glimpse of. Um, you know, uh, what our members do in general. We have a diverse set of membership. Uh, so some of them are engaged in education and awareness, particularly the ones that, you know, uh, we have Navin Taufik there um, from Ministry of um, uh, ICT in Egypt. Uh, um, and Naveen had been very much engaged from the beginning with the coalition in terms of education and awareness and in terms of guiding policy and also within uh, the Arab region a lot of legal reform work. Um, and talking of Naveen, I just want to introduce our another new member. Um, it's called Aitisal NGO, who is the member of the National Egyptian COP Committee, represented by Mr. Hossam El Gamal, who is not here today, 
but um, they are a new member. Uh, what this um, diverse set of uh, people bring to the table is a rich set of experience and um, resources that uh, every member from different region can benefit from. And we are not going to uh, delve into what each one of us are doing, but um, we are, uh, in summary, the key areas of work are online safety, resources for children, child participation, uh, uh, education and awareness amongst community, uh, also working at legal reform projects, working with uh, ministries, uh, and both regional and international level. So it is a cross-cutting um, platform. Uh, we do have a representation from the um, industry where uh, we have in uh, we sorry, um, IWF, and we also have from GSMA who is not able to uh, come here today. Finally, I would just like to um, give the floor uh, very briefly to uh, Pritam Malu from ITU, who is also one of our members. Um, ITU COP is a member of the Dynamic Coalition. Uh, very briefly to present um, uh, what uh, they are doing in terms of. Um, the COP guidelines for industry. So I'll just pull up the slide and if Pritam, uh, yes, of course. Yeah, and my apologies for missing out Jacqueline and Kim who are very much in front, forefront um, are representing Microsoft and um, I do beg your apologies for omitting you from the industry partners, uh, my apologies. Um, am I missing anyone who is here who um, is a regular? And then Juta Kroll was here, but I don't see her. Um, uh, I'm looking, see, I have a long, <laughs> very long side. So Juta is here, one of our uh, founder members um, representing, <coughs> excuse me, digital, well, I, I, I can't never pronounce the full name in German, but it's, uh, uh, she does a lot of work with young people, uh, giving them empowerment and access uh, in Germany. Uh, so that's the kind of strength that we have, the diversity of our members. Okay, so um, Pritam, if you um, would like to say a couple of words on you know, ITU COP guidelines, I can pull up the slides. Yeah, not to scare you, there will be just one slide. Uh, so before I do that, um, uh, thanks to Anjan for inviting us. Uh, my colleague Carla uh, is uh, the one who uh, works on this topic. She is the focal point and I am sure most of you in the room know her. Uh, so if you uh, please pass on the, uh, your cards uh, if you need to get in touch with us, ITU, and we will make sure that we will get back to you on that. Uh, Specifically on the guidelines, of course, uh, you might know that in 2009, ITU, working with the uh, COP partners, released a set of four guidelines uh, for children, for parents, guardians, and educators, for industry, and for policy makers. And uh, this year, uh, our working group on child online protection, uh, which, is, which is a group of members, multi-stakeholder group, uh, including all COP partners, uh, decided that it's, it's time for the industry guidelines to be updated because uh, since 2009 the world has moved a bit, quite a bit. Uh, the technologies have changed, the access to technologies have changed, a variety has changed. So uh, since the beginning of this year, ITU uh, with the COP partners have been working on revising the guidelines and we are particularly grateful to UNICEF in this regard because they have been they have taken the lead in uh, the uh, uh, editorship of this uh, new uh, revised guidelines. So we've gone through a, a multiple set of iterations. Uh, I think many in this room have contributed. We are grateful for that. And uh, right now we are at a stage where uh, we have a draft guidelines that uh, we now require multi-stakeholder input. And uh, the open forum that we had this morning, uh, the ITU units of joint open forum, was one step in the multi-stakeholder input. We, and we are thankful for the input that we received. Uh, we also put the guidelines online, and you will see the uh, link there. Uh, and it will be, I mean, by tonight, it will also be directly accessible from the ITU and the UNICEF websites, itu.in slash cop, uh, and also on the main page, and unicef.org slash CSR. Uh, and we invite you to pass on this message to your members 
to contribute to making the guidelines uh, much better and uh, useful for all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Pritham. Um, so, I mean, that is a kind of wrap up of the session they had uh, this morning. Um, I would like to, you know, that was more of like an update from our general member sections. Um, I would really be happy if you can take the, uh, the you know, uh, outside of this forum after we finish uh, to keep in touch and to share the resources um, and connect with each other on a continuous basis as a platform for sharing information because we only meet once a year um, at this forum. Uh, we should be using um, the online platforms or you know, other channels of communication to keep our interactions going. Um, with that said, I'd I just like to um, open the presentation section for today. Um, as I said before, we have three presentations all related to, uh, in some ways, the uh, element of child con combating child sexual abuse materials online. And my first speaker uh, is Russell Chadwick from InHope, who's going to give you um, an overall umbrella understanding of how do they see the problem, what kind of reports are emerging, and the trends. So without further ado, I pass the floor to you, Russell. And good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'd just like to say thank you to ECPAT for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, for those that you, of you that don't uh, know what In Hope do, I've put together some slides which will outline the work of the association and also give you some information on what we provide to um, st our stakeholders, which is law enforcement. So, who we are. We were founded in 1999 under the Safer Internet uh, Program to combat uh, child sexual abuse material. Um, we're an umbrella organization. We represent 44 hotlines in 38 countries. Um, the headquarters in, is in Amsterdam, even though I'm based in the UK. Um, I sort of travel over to, to Brussels and Amsterdam on a regular basis. And we're co-funded uh, through our membership and the EC. What do we do? So we support and enhance the performance of the hotlines. So we try and share best practice uh, training uh, modules to improve the effectiveness of the hotlines. Uh, we also um, are, are able to uh, take down um, content as quickly as possible. We assess, trace, liaise, take down and monitor. Uh, and we've got working partnerships with law enforcement uh, and um, safer internet centers around the world. So why are our statistics important? Um, we collect accurate and timely statistics to be able to pass through to stakeholders. We provide actionable intelligence and quality leads. We build a global picture of what activity is going on on the internet, illegal child sexual abuse material. Um, and we give factual information through to stakeholders on trends and, and volume of data. Uh, we've developed our own uh, in-house database, uh, which is called the IHRMS, uh, for the hotlines to um, um, uh, transfer data through to us. Uh, now, looking at the role and the process, we've got 44 hotlines, 150 analysts that assess content, they trace, uh, they deposit the CSAM URLs into the database so we can collect that information. And then we liaise with um, uh, law enforcement and content service providers uh, and they issue notice and takedown to remove that content from the internet. We, one of our um, objectives is to reduce uh, the, the time that the um, illegal content is on the internet. So one of our goals is to remove that as quickly as possible. So it's all about closer participation with stakeholders. Um, strategic alliances are really important to us. So if you look, and I'm not going to read through all these, but you can see from the, the slide, we've got a lot of um, strategic partnerships with industry, with government, with, uh, with uh, NGOs. 
Now this part of the presentation is showing you some statistical data, um, actual statistical data from the 1st of January to the 30th of June. So hotlines offer a variety of, a variety of remits on a national basis. Uh, but typically what we look for is bad hosting ca categories. We consider besides CSAM or adult pornography, uh, um, child sexual tourism, child trafficking, uh, violence, racism and xenophobia and also terrorism. Now the hotlines do offer um, a broader categories um, in some respects but those are the common categories that all the association members um, uh, adhere to. Um, looking at the statistics so far in the first six months we've had 447,000 public reports of suspected illegal content. And this uh, graphic is um, showing you where that content is coming from currently. So 40% of it is coming from the EU, 42% uh, from the US and Canada, and 18% from the rest of the world. Really interesting data. Um, so looking at trend data, so a worrying development is the increasing incidence of very young children as victims. Uh, we've got age categories, and based on our findings, 12% um, uh, victims are infants, and this last year was 9%. 79% of the victims are female, 11% are male. Uh, and this is a, a graphic that we've got in our annual report um, that shows that, that data up a lot easier to read. And also, there's commercial um, hosting for CSAM. Um, when we say commercial, that means a financial trans 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 um, transaction is taking place. Um, it's about 11%, but when you look at the volume, it's huge. So this is a, a, another slide that we produce for the European Financial Coalition. So this shows the trend data in um, uh, commercial hosting by country on a global scale. So network activity, which is um, really interesting data. So 34% of commercial, um, 34,000 reports uh, have been uh, put into the database on commercial activity so far. Uh, that represents 95% of global hosting. So we're capturing the data. This next slide actually gives you the hosting countries um, as of those dates. And then looking at uh, non-in-hope um, hosting countries. Um, so we, you can see that we can start to um, put together a global view of where uh, CSAM has been hosted um, and so it'll, it gives us the opportunity to be able to take that data down. Hosting trends, this just gives you a flavour of the hosting trends I've taken three countries um, of how they're, they're mapping current hosting. And then as I said earlier, notice and takedown is very important to us. So we, we monitor this closely. Um, it's one of our de um, uh, deliverables within the EC grant is to be able to improve this area. So you can see that the majority of the, of the um, illegal content is being removed within a day. This gives us the trend data. So content removed in a day is improving, which is um, the target to try and remove all this data once we see it within a day. Now this is very interesting data. So this is looking at um, a particular country um, with their ISPs. Um, so the data on the left, or the ISP on the left, um, has been cooperating closely with law enforcement. So if you look at the 32% um, of their content has been removed in a day, 24% within two days. So you would say that this ISP is cooperating with taking down illegal content. 
However, if you then you look to the far right, you look at an ISP that actually has been notified of um, illegal content, they've still got 57% of that still up and running after five days. And indeed, 38% has not been removed at all. So that would be an area for um, discussion with um, law enforcement, um, not for in hope, but for um, law enforcement to um, um, talk to the ISP why they've not removed that content. Then domain train trends that we can look at. So we can identify patterns. Um, so with this, the light green is showing you the traffic within the domain. Then it, all of a sudden it, it, it dies in July. But then the light blue appears. And what's happened here is that the domain name's changed. So we talked to the hotline and they've identified that where the, the traffic's moved to. Then if you look at that on a, on a, um, a live uh, issue, look, this is showing us within two and three month periods that actually the domains move country, they also move ISP, so we can give that trend data to our stakeholders. So notice and takedown is an area of real importance to us, um, and it's by working closely with law enforcement we can improve that. So this is a live example of a, a European hotline that is now working much closer with the law enforcement, whereas it was taking six days to take the content down. Now they're talking much um, on a, a, a more collaborative basis. That content is being removed within a day, and that is, is great news. Um, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Russell. <laughs> So, um, if anyone would like to point uh, or have any questions uh, related to his presentation, uh, very quickly, if, you, if there is anything that you want to add or to ask him. Uh, your data was very interesting, and particularly the, the, you know, the ones that still remains up after five days. And I think uh, when John uh, leads us to the discussion, uh, this could be some of the facts that can be brought over. Um, in terms of uh, challenges and issues. Um, so my second speaker, so do we have anyone? Uh, yes, please. Uh, uh, please introduce yourself. Hello. Uh, my name is Ablash Mar. I'm an academic at Northumbria University in Newcastle. Um, just a, a, a question on the bad hosting categories you outlined. Uh, you mentioned adult porn accessible to children. Uh, but isn't all porn accessible to children? I mean, is that a particular subset within adult pornography on the internet. Yeah. Yes, it is. And, and there are, the hotlines have got a much broader categories. Um, but when we, we research the common um, categories, those were the 13 that we got. Um, I can give you the, the, the data offline um, in terms of how we get that, uh, those build those categories. Um, the majority of um, the content is CSAM, um, child sexual abuse material. Um, we do track terrorism, but it's uh, n not a huge amount. Um, but I think um, some of the, the hotlines have got 26 categories. So you've already shared it, right? the video. Okay. 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 <coughs> so our next speaker is, uh, is uh, Susie Hargreaves from the IWF, and um, she will start uh, with a video, a very short video, uh, that gives you uh, very comprehensively what they're doing. Sexually abused, it affects them for life. And when they are filmed or photographed being sexually abused, it leaves them exploited. Can can you hear? No. So. Okay. It it worked in the morning, right? Yeah. I'll just I'll just. Uh, do you want me to try again? 
Yes, we did, but okay. I'll I'll try again, and if you have your headsets, you can probably put it in. Okay, I'll t let's uh, try it one more time. When a child is sexually abused, it affects them for life. And when they are filmed or photographed being sexually abused, it leaves them exploited by those who seek their images. By reporting these images, you can help stop this exploitation. At the Internet Watch Foundation, we work with the online industry to eliminate images of child sexual abuse from the Internet. Each year, we receive thousands of reports to our hotline. But we need your help. If you see something online which you think violates no, the think, laws on... Yeah, I think we, we would probably revert back to hearing it from the horse's mouth. Okay. So. Okay, here's the horse. Right, so um, thanks very much. I'm delighted to be here to talk about the work of the Internet Watch Foundation and our work as members of the Dynamic Coalition. We're new members, so thanks for inviting us to join. Uh, we work with a lot of people in this room, and increasingly we have a much higher global footprint. Um, I do have, I did have hundreds of these videos of the IWF, um, and they were on memory sticks, but I think every single member of law enforcement in this building has taken one of our memory sticks, so obviously to watch our video, not to keep the memory stick. But anyway, so I'm um, sorry I can't show that video. It's up on our website. It explains what we do. Uh, the IWF is the UK hotline for reporting criminal content, specifically child sexual abuse content hosted anywhere in the world, non-photographic images of child sexual abuse content hosted in the UK, and obscene adult content hosted in the UK. About 99.9% .9 of what we do, even more, is child sexual abuse content hosted anywhere in the world. Um, so uh, the... The video kind of explains how we work and uh, just quickly go over some of the key areas. We're a charity and a self-regulatory body. We're entirely independent of law enforcement and of the government and we're funded by the internet industry. 80% of our money comes from the industry and 20% from the EU as we're a third of the UK Safer Internet Centre with Childnet International and the South West Grid for Learning. We're very interesting from a governance point of view because we are self-regulatory. We have no powers to enforce. The internet industry removes content voluntarily. Um, we, um, we're one of the most successful hotlines in the world at removing content in our own country. Content in the UK is removed in less than an hour. Um, we've also worked very hard internationally so that over the last 17 years we've been able to bring down content that we identify from 20 days to 10 days, but it's still 10 days. So we're very proud of the fact that in the UK we have this exemplary record in removing the content. Uh, when we started, 18% of content was hosted in the UK. It's now less than 1%. The UK is one of the most hostile territories in the world to host child sexual abuse content, and that's because of all the stakeholders and the cooperation and the partnerships. We're very fast, we're very quick, and that's because the internet industry um, cooperates with us 100%. So um, I'll just quickly talk, I was asked to talk about some of the trends we see. Russell's talked about some of these trends. So uh, what's the scale of child sexual abuse images? How many of them are there out there? Well, the reality is no one actually knows, and I know John's going to talk about some numbers. We're always quite uh, skeptical about the numbers. Um, we hear numbers that don't particularly mirror what we see, but then we don't see what other people see. So, you know, we're not saying we have any definitive data on this as well. What we can tell you is that uh, uh, the UNODC um, uh, reported that they thought there were a million unique images in circulation and around 50,000 added each year. What our analysts see is about... Um, uh, nearly all the images we see are duplicates, so they're recirculated images, and some might be 10 or 20 years old. And we see roughly, it's not a, an absolute figure, but roughly around one to two new children a week. The importance of that is that every time we see a new child, we can take immediate action because the analysts know. And every single image is a child that's been sexually abused. It's a crime scene, and every single image is unacceptable and needs to be removed however many times it goes back up again. The type of content we see in 2012, 81% of that content was of children aged 10 and under, 4% was under 2. Um, that was actually down from the year before, 
and 53% was of the worst kind. In the UK, it's graded 1 to 5. 53% uh, was level 4 and 5, which is uh, the rape and sexual torture of children, mainly involving an adult and a child. Um, in the UK, uh, the content that we see, we tend to think of it as white men abusing white children, predominantly girls, but obviously increasingly the number of boys. And we also see a, a, an increasing number of Asian children as well. We're starting to see new patterns emerging, uh, particularly in a discussion with our other sister hotlines. For instance, the South African hotline is starting to see black children being abused by black adults. And this was our experience as well when we went to talk to um, uh, law enforcement and partners in Uganda where we've been doing some work. So we're starting to see new pa patterns emerge. Obviously, one of the issues around the uh, internet penetration developing in developing countries is that we're starting to see new uh, areas of child sexual abuse emerge from that. Um, just uh, quickly tell you a little bit about um, uh, Russell talks about where the content was hosted, so I don't think I will talk uh, particularly about that. One of the things I wanted to talk about was the importance of uh, trying to stop people going there in the first place. It's our experience from our research that the most likely people to stumble across child sexual abuse content are young men aged 18 to 25, and we'd like to stop them going there in the first place. Uh, we've only recently, and I have to say it's slow compared to other countries, introduced splash pages. So we have a blocking list for all content that's hosted outside of the UK. And from now, um, anytime anybody tries to access uh, a URL that's on our blocking list, they now receive a splash page warning telling them about the potential ramifications of what they're doing. Um, this is quite a new thing in the UK. It's taken us about 10 years to bring in, actually. So we're not particularly proud that this has taken so long, uh, but it has just uh, come into play. Um, the other, the big issues for us in the UK are, and big issues I would say within the field are, um, we have a current situation, it's very high profile in, in the United Kingdom, uh, that followed, uh, we've had a year of extremely high um, public cases, um, started with what we call the Jimmy Savile effect, a major personality in the UK being exposed as one of the biggest abusers of children of all time, and that's just continued and it, it really peaked earlier in the year with the uh, two murders of uh, two young girls and the murder cases happened concurrently for um, their murderers in the UK and they both of them were shown to have um, images of child sexual abuse on their computers and they had no previous records or no previous um, uh, linked to it and then they went out and murdered these two children and as a result of that for the first time in court a link was made between looking at uh, images and actually going out and committing absolutely horrific offences. Um, this raised a huge outcry in the, in, the, in the UK from the media, from the public and it was picked up by government at the highest level and the Prime Minister has been taking it forward. To give you an example of the extent of the outcry, in July 2012 we did 75 pieces of media, that was television, radio, newsprint. Um, in July 2013 we did 2,500 and we're a tiny little charity based in the UK. So suddenly it's kind of totally gone right up into the, the highest, you know, not just the highest echelons in terms of power, but in terms of public perception. So it's a really big deal in the UK at the moment. The scale of the problem is really big. We might be great at doing it in the UK and attacking this, but we have to deal with it internationally. We're very concerned about self-generated content. We've seen more and more self-generated content from uh, uh, young people, particularly teenagers. One of the issues for us at the IWF is if we can't verify their ages, it's impossible for us to take action. And um, so that's some, an area we're working on very carefully to see how we can protect particularly people in the sort of 15 to 18 age group. And then another big area is obviously peer-to-peer. -peer. We only deal with what's out there in the public domain, but a very big issue is the issue of sharing content on peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay. And uh, I've just been given a warning, so I'd have to sort of talk about what the big issues are and the overall uh, scale of the issue in the UK, and I think that pretty much captures it. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Susie. I think uh, both of your presentation, uh, you know, speaks of the, the need to address this issue, you know, the, the global nature, and that that we don't have uh, hotlines in all all parts of the world, and it kind of uh, 
well, I'm sure John will, in his session, will discuss the, the, the why we are doing this exercise, the one that we'll engage in, and what it will lead us to. I think these are also the other aspects that, you know, the, the type of uh, these images that you're seeing, the scale of the problem, and why we, um, the policymakers needs to pay attention to the problem. Um, so thank you very much for uh, sharing the, the trends and information about uh, the reports that you receive. Uh, with that, I pass it on to Bindu Sharma uh, from ICMEC, and she's going to present uh, the work of the Financial Coalition and how that's going to, how, the impact that it has made and some of the, uh, the ongoing work uh, in relation to um, fighting child sexual abuse materials. Thank you. Thank you, Anjan. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation uh, uh, by ECPAT International. And uh, I'm glad I actually follow Russell and Susie in their presentations because they gave us an extremely clear overview of what the, si the situation is globally on the issue of child sec online child sexual exploitation. I will really zero in on just one program that is looking at the commercial side of this uh, issue. I'm Bindu Sharma. I represent the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I'm based in Singapore, and I have a colleague here in the audience with me also who's here from the US. Uh, as I said, I'll highlight just one of our programs, which is the Global, the Financial Coalition Against Child Pornography, working towards eradicating online commercial child pornography. I'll quit, you know, as I said, uh, I don't want to repeat uh, what Russell and uh, Susie have already said. We've seen figures that, that they have presented. We realize that it is scope and extent of the issue is uh, pretty dramatic. Uh, a few st statistics I put out here, one coming in from the US cyber tip line. They've received more than 1.9 million reports since it was launched in 1998. And also under the Child Victim Identification Program, they have viewed and analyzed more than 90 million images since 2002. So you can well imagine the gravity of the issue. Uh, CyberTip Canada, on the commercial side, uh, I, I would like to highlight this one uh, statistic here. CyberTip Canada, which is the Canada reporting mechanism. Uh, in 2007 to 2008, over a two-year period, uh, reviewed commercial e-businesses uh, you know, e online and identified 27 different types of payment systems used. 85% of them sold memberships with recurring monthly payments ranging from $4 to $490. Uh, and we all know uh, uh, statistics put out by the UN ODC in their June 2010 globalization of crime uh, uh, study. They suspect that this uh, Industry generates around 50,000 new images each year, and it's probably worth $250 million globally. So what does, at least in Asia, very often these are the kind of media headlines we see. I'll zero in on a couple of them here. Uh, most recently, uh, which has been uh, of most concern to a lot of us here, uh, uh, Anjan and I have discussed it uh, often, uh, the case of a Swedish uh, national uh, ordering on-demand, online uh, child sexual abuse of children based out of uh, the Philippines. 
uh, the payment me mechanisms used were, you know, extremely legitimate corporate uh, industry platforms like uh, Western Union, PayPal, credit cards. So that's where the whole responsibility of industry comes in on this issue. The other one I would like to highlight is a recent study coming out of Australia where a new study reveals that uh, it was done in Tasmania actually and they, they interviewed about 400 students on campus and a good percentage of them, the study was found that one in ten people believed that there was nothing wrong in viewing child pornography, not adult pornography. So these are the young 20-somethings within our society today who, because of the exposure of illegal and inappropriate content and the availability and accessibility of it on internet, uh, have come to believe that it's the norm. It's okay to be there and to watch it. So much for that, and you know, so I'll zero in on the financial coalition. The background to that is it was launched in 2005, coming out of a scandal in the U.S., where a PayPal account was being used to buy, sell, and access child pornography. It was a piece of New York uh, Times investigative journalism. The way the U.S. reacted is a huge outcry. Uh, the financial payments industry was called to the mat by for congressional hearings, and basically threatened with legislation unless they did something. And that's how the Financial Coalition was set up in collaboration with two organizations, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and the International Center. The one goal of the coalition is to really disrupt the economics of this trade, to really make it unprofitable for people who use this as a commercial e-business to be able to make money selling such images. Uh, as I said, we work with the National Center, which is our sister organization. It's in the National Clearinghouse uh, in the U.S. around any issue surrounding child protection. Uh, and what's unique with the National Center is, because of congressional mandate, it has law enforcement sitting with them in the NGO, working with them, and therefore they have great powers to actually ha make things happen. In the Financial Coalition, we really work closely with one of the programs of the National Center, which is the Cyber Tip Line. It's an internet hotline, a reporting mechanism where public as well as ISPs and industry can report in illegal content. I will skip through this, but because of the fact that because of congressional pressure as well as congressional mandate, the, the Financial coalition in the U.S. is an operational coalition where law enforcement sitting with industry actually does test transactions to follow the money where these e you know, to do a test transactions to understand the business model of these uh, e-businesses uh, e and e-commerce uh, merchants, to follow the money, understand the business model, and disrupt the economics of it. So I won't go into the details of this because I don't think we think have that much time in there. But I would like to share is uh, the referrals that come in to the cyber tip line are not only coming in from the US. The cyber tip line takes in reports coming in from everywhere. The figures represented here on the screen, and that's something I would really like to give a definition of what these figures stand for, because otherwise they're open for misinterpretation. These reports refer to the, uh, the content is hosted by U in the U.S., uh, you know, hosted on ser uh, servers in the U.S., but these figures represent the number of individuals accessing or uploading illegal content that the user is in the third country but is accessing and using a U.S.-hosted site. So these are figures from all different countries in Asia. Where, so you can see that it's not, very often in Asia, I'll backtrack here, very often in Asia when I have conversations with governments, they say, no, no, it's not, uh, it's a Western problem. And as Susie earlier po pointed out, uh, unfortunately at this point in time, majority of the images that we see are of Caucasian children. So Asian governments very comfortably say, oh, it's a Western problem. And these figures from the cyber chip line will very clearly uh, tell you that it's an issue, it's a global issue. Here's another set of Asian countries where we have figures from. Uh, and what, what are these figures reporting? Um, 
These are the categories under which uh, the reports come in, and child pornography makes up over 90% of the reports that come in. Who's reporting? Initially, it was the public. More reports were coming in from the public. But uh, in increasingly, as you see now, industry is stepping up to the issue. And more of the reports are now being uh, are coming in from ISPs and technology companies and content hosts. Uh, who's reporting? What, again, is very interesting is uh, obviously when the cyber tip line was set up first, uh, it was it's a US uh, hotline. Most of the reports were coming in from US industry or US uh, uh, public. Increasingly now, international reporting overtakes industry and public reporting in the US. So it is indeed a global issue. Uh, so, you know, so those are the figures coming out of the work of the Financial Coalition. In addition to that, the Financial Coalition has also over the years put out three thought leadership pieces around uh, merchant acquisition and monitoring of best practices, other best practices around trends uh, on online crime. We also run a webinar for the financial payments industry on um, uh, child pornography, keeping child pornography merchants out of their payment systems. We know it's working, and I'll only give you a, a read out the first thing. The cyber tip line reports a 50% drop in the number of unique commercial child pornography websites reported into, uh, into it. Uh, the other trend that is uh, very telling is uh, again, this is coming out of the Cyber Tip Canada, where they, were, uh, the, uh, where they did uh, the monitoring of these e-merchants. They have seen a, a consistent increase in the membership costs for these kind of uh, uh, websites, uh, really Im uh, clearly implying that the industry and financial coalition uh, uh, efforts are effective in disrupting that, and therefore it's far more expensive to access these uh, sites. Who are our members? It's a you know, broad swathe, a swathe of uh, uh, the financial industry as well as the technology industry. In the Asia Pacific, we have a, a, you know, it's, a, it's slightly more diverse because it's at a regional level, so we have regional law enforcement companies as well as NGOs. And in the Asia Pacific, I will highlight one of our efforts, which is the most recent effort uh, in just last month in September. Prior to that, first three years, we've really been looking at creating awareness at a regional level. But in, over the three years, having built up a sufficient membership in the Asia Pacific, I held a New Zealand roundtable, or one day New Zealand roundtable, specifically around the issue. We came out of that roundtable, uh, and I'll, uh, you know, uh, I'll backtrack on that and say, uh, we had 15 law enforcement officers, we had nine bankers, we had five I, uh, uh, technology and ISP representatives there. So it was a true cross-section of industry, uh, uh, law enforcement and civil society. We came out with it, from it with a working group, and I am currently working with four banks in New Zealand, uh, and they are in agreement with the fact, and they are uh, having conversations with law enforcement. They will make live accounts, payment accounts, available to law enforcement to do test transactions within the New Zealand uh, domain to track these uh, kinds of e-commerce, to understand their business model, and then disrupt it. And that's, I can stop at that, really. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bindu. Any questions for Bindu from the room or for uh, any of the other uh, panelists that we have? Uh, I don't see any hands there. Uh, but you did mention uh, very interesting points regarding the, and I, I know I've been following the work of the Financial Coalition. It's very promising that the, the industry is coming forward, the bankers are now move, moving forward. Maybe it can infuse some of the members here in back in their countries how to get this process going because we know we need global attention to this problem. And so uh, with that, I pass the floor to John uh, to lead us. Uh, yeah, to lead us to the rest of the uh, session today on child abuse images and indicators. Okay, otherwise by the end of by the end of the afternoon you'll be sitting in the palm <laughs> trees over there um, okay um, good afternoon uh, my name is John Carr and I've recently uh, been appointed global advisor to ECPA International based in Bangkok although and you'd never get it from my accent I am in fact British um, 
and uh, t today we're meeting for the last time as the dynamic coalition. In future, we're going to meet as the super dynamic, hyper energetic, never stop moving coalition. Um, and I hope at the end of this uh, presentation, you'll see why. Uh, I hope that's where we're going to be. Um, now, I had a video uh, to show you, um, but for the reasons we all now know, I won't. But I, what I will do is try to tell you briefly what that video said. It, it was a, uh, an extract from um, one of our national TV news channels, ITN News, um, that went out on the, I think it was the 28th of May uh, this year, so, so not very long ago. And the main person being spoken, speaking, in, and being interviewed in this news clip, and by the way, if anybody wants it, if you, the news clip, if you just let me know, I can send you a link to Dropbox, uh, sorry, SkyDrive, uh, where you can, uh, where you'll be able to, and in fact I have it on both, uh, where you'll be able to uh, pick it up. Uh, anyway, the person being uh, interviewed in this video clip is called Peter Davis, and he is Britain's top cop when it comes to online child protection. He's the head of SEOP. Um, and in the interview, well, he basically acknowledges that the British police are unable to cope with the volume of uh, offenders and the volume of images which they now know with a great deal of certainty are actually being cir circulated within the, United, within the internet in the United Kingdom. Um, and I'll come back to those numbers in a second. Uh, they formed an important part of his, uh, of his interview. There's another video clip which again I, uh, I would have shown if I could, uh, but which again I'll send to you if you want. And this video clip is from another news program that went out two weeks later uh, in the beginning of June. And in that uh, video clip, you see a man called Mick Moran, who is the head of the um, child protection section, so to speak, of Interpol in, in Lyon, the global police agency. And in that interview, Mick Moran basically says, there is no police force in Europe that is on top of this problem. Now, he was being interviewed by uh, Euronews, so he was speaking only about Europe, but I can tell you with complete certainty, he might as well have said the world. But the truth is uh, that the uh, volumes of, of images and the numbers of people downloading and exchanging them online have outstripped the capacity of any police force anywhere in the world uh, to be able to deal with them by conventional or traditional policing methods. Now, we've known this for quite a long time, people on the inside. We, we've been aware of this fact uh, for ages, but never before have such senior police officers gone on the record, on TV, and acknowledged it in public. And I think both of them deserve a great deal of, of credit for their bravery in, in doing so, because I'm sure the reason they didn't previously disclosed the true scale of this problem was because they didn't want to panic the public or they didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to cause people undue or unnecessary anxiety. And they probably thought that it was in somehow in the, in the public's best interest uh, for them to suppress this, this information. Uh, I think suppressing the truth very rarely helps in any debate. But what is absolutely true is that you can't possibly have an adult conversation about what you're going to do about a problem unless you all agree what the facts of that problem are. Well, I think now, as a result of these recent disclosures by Interpol on the one hand and by the British police on the other, I think we can all now uh, begin to discuss and debate what it is in fact we're going to do because even though we've heard about tremendous work being done by InHope um, and the IWF and by industry around the world and I'm going to speak specifically about Microsoft uh, uh, later on, whatever it is we've been doing up to now, it's not working or it's not working well enough. It's not, we're not matching the scale of the problem. And we've, we've got a, a decision to make, if you like, as a, as a, as a community, as a world community, or, or however you want to put it. Either we sit, sit back and accept that this is the new reality, that it's completely beyond the capacity of the state and its police services to deal with this problem, or, and this is certainly the view ECPAT International takes, 
we try to up the ante and try to get more and more attention and resources devoted to trying to, to, to deal with it. And that's uh, certainly the proposition that I'm going to uh, put forward. We have to find new ways to galvanize public opinion around this question because unless we can, if we can't find ways to galvanize public opinion and get more attention focused on this question, we have no hope of getting governments to increase the efforts that, that they're going to make and increase the resources that they're willing to give uh, to, to the police forces. Sorry, I just remembered uh, I said I would give you some numbers. I'm now going to do that. Now, these numbers came out of the UK, but I've no reason to suppose the UK is madly different from anywhere else. But even if you, take the U and even if you took the UK as a single standalone example, I think what emerged was, was alarming. So this is what happened. Uh, one of our children's organizations sent a request, an official request, to every police force in England and Wales um, asking the police uh, force in that area to tell them how many child abuse images they had seized in the two-year period that ended April 2012. Now, in the time scale that, that we were working to, only put five police forces actually replied um, to the question. By the way, they, they were legally obliged to, to answer the question because it was under our Freedom of Information uh, Act. Five police forces replied. None of them covered a major urban area. They were all predominantly forces that covered largely rural uh, areas. I mean, they had small cities in them, but they, they, it, didn't, it didn't include London. It didn't include Birmingham. It didn't include Manchester or Leeds. It covered, you know, it covered smaller uh, population areas than that. Uh, these five police forces nonetheless reported that in that two-year period they had seized 26 million uh, images in the different actions which they had taken during that period. Now, I showed the, the data that we got to a professional statistician and he looked at the demographics of those five police force areas and he said, well, broadly speaking, it's, it's not likely to be very different across the whole country because the demographics of those five uh, police areas are essentially representative of the population of England and wealth as a whole. And if that's true, because remember, you're looking at population or probabilities within populations rather than necessarily the level of police activity alone, um, if that was true, that would suggest that in excess of 300 million images would have been seized by police forces across England and Wales as a whole during that two-year period. And that compares with, uh, you know, 7,000 images that the police knew about in 1995, which was, if you like, year zero for, for the Internet. Um, now, just uh, 300 million images is a very, very big number. It could mean, however, that only five guys did it because uh, you don't know exactly the volumes of each uh, images, of images that any individual person who was arrested might have downloaded. But we do have a clue about that, because also in that TV interview, what, uh, what, the, uh, what Peter Davis revealed was that the police had been monitoring the exchange of child abuse images over peer-to-peer -peer networks within the United Kingdom. And what he disclosed, again, very bravely, I thought, was that the police had identified um, between 50 and 60,000 individual IP addresses within the UK where people had either been downloading or exchanging um, child abuse images. These were known child abuse images, of course. Um, now, just let me tell you, um, 50 to 60,000 people uh, is a hell of a lot of people. In no year, in no year, since records began in Britain, and that's 1988 for these purposes, in no year have the British police arrested ever more than 2,500 people. What that means, if you do the maths, it's quite easy. Assuming there were no new crimes uh, ever committed <laughs> relating to child abuse images, the last person that the police already know about today would not be arrested until 2032. So, in other words, and he, again, uh, Peter Davis says this in, uh, specifically in the interview, we cannot arrest them all. I'd like to, he said, 
but we're never going to be able to do that. Uh, the British prison system only has places for 91,000 people. Uh, at the moment, there are 92,000 people in those prisons. Uh, so even if we could arrest them all, it's simply impossible to imagine where, what we would do with them, where we would put them. So the, the key point is to illustrate, uh, again, the point I was making at the opening, Whatever we've been doing up to now, it's not working well enough, and we have to find new and better ways of addressing it. And what ECPAT International wants to do, and, hope, and we, what we hope, one of the things that will come out of this, is a renewed coalition, a new approach where we can all work together to try and find a way to push this matter up, up, the, up the political uh, agenda. And with the um, UN's new millennium, millennium development goals um, coming into view, people are working on, on propositions and proposals now. What EPA International very much wants to do is to get the UN millennium goals to accept as an indicator of progress in this space how a measured reduction in the volume of images and the number of people involved in downloading them. And uh, so that means getting hold of hard numbers because you will not get a Millennium Development Goal accepted by the UN processes or the UN machinery unless you can put hard numbers around it. And we want people to work with us as ECPA International to develop um, information tools that will, will, will help convince the UN that this is a realistic uh, possibility. I'm very happy to say uh, that I've spoken to police officers around the world because, you know, it's not always obvious, is it, that if people start getting numbers uh, about your real level of achievement or work, that it's always going to be welcomed because what it means in effect that you're becoming more accountable, that your actions are being more scrutinized, well, I'm uh, more thoroughly scrutinized. Well, I'm happy to say that in this particular case, maybe after a little bit of uh, umming and ahhing, the cops get the message. If we cannot get numbers, if we can't get a better grip on the numbers in this space, it's going to become increasingly difficult to get governments uh, to put money behind it. Because if we, if we can't demonstrate uh, the, uh, some, in some way or another, it will never be perfect. But there's no, 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 as Susie said, a lot of this activity, you can never be sure of the true scale of it. But we, there are bits of it that we will be able to put together through monitoring peer-to-peer -peer networks, through collecting in hopes data about the number of URLs that are being reported, through uh, reports about the number of takedowns that are being achieved. There are a whole range of sorts of numbers around that if we can find a way to bring them together in an intelligent way, we think will help uh, shape uh, the political agenda for, for this go, um, going forward. But it's not what we also want the new super dynamic, highly energized, never stop moving coalition also to, to think about are a range of other measures. Because uh, that thing around the Millennium De Development Goals and the, and the numbers and so on, that's pretty much a sort of medium to longer term objective. Exceptionally important, but nonetheless it's not going to deliver in the very short term. But there are a, a number of other things that we want to, to see being promoted more energetically. One of them is the greater deployment of products like Microsoft's photo DNA. Um, Susie mentioned, uh, and I mentioned, the, the role that peer-to-peer -peer networks are playing in this. I mean, most of the stuff that Russell and Susie were talking about earlier were reports uh, that came from websites, URLs, content that was being uh, found on the web. There's very little doubt in my mind that the bulk of activity is shifting away from the web. I'm not, the web will always be important. We can never take our eye off the web because it is the most user-friendly and easiest um, interface to use. But there's no doubt at all that the big volumes of illegal images and child, uh, child abuse um, are now shifting into peer-to-peer -peer networks. And also, I'm sad to say, on the dark net. But let's, uh, you know, Tor clients and then using encryption and that kind of thing. But let's, let's come to that bit of it later. That's the, the really, really hard stuff. This bit is doable now through using greater deployment of products like photo DNA. Maybe other companies will develop similar tools. But any, any 
any major cloud service provider, any, any major company, in my view, that's providing any kind of public storage, whether it's free or paid for, should be deploying PhotoDNA or a product like that. Um, because if they're not doing that, then they're more or less saying we don't really care that much about whether people are using the services that we're providing to store or exchange or distribute child abuse images. So very much at the core of this will be uh, an eye of this new campaign that we hope uh, will develop will be things like that. Splash pages were mentioned by Susie in relation to uh, people trying to access URLs of known where the, where the address is known to contain illegal images. What we're also pressing for um, in the UK and the ECPAT International will also be pressing for on a on a more on a wider basis is for the search engine companies to get involved in this. It's all very well if a guy is, uh, is trying to access a known address, but we don't think the search engine companies should be uh, an easy route for people to find a lot of child abuse uh, type material. And, uh, and uh, we we're not we don't we're not we don't know anything officially yet, but um, I'm expecting good news on that from from several. Uh, of, of the search engine companies, or at least two, the two most important ones in the in the near future. Um, so the other, f actually, we, we, if I keep talking, and I certainly could, as you know, um, there won't be any time for discussion. So one other project that we want the new super dynamic, highly energized, never stop moving coalition also to to join ECPAT International in is developing a lexicon and a lexicon actually that's, I'm sorry I shouldn't use posh words should I a dictionary a new dictionary of child of, of terms that are used in child abuse now that one of the wonderful things about ECPAT International and one of the reasons I'm really really happy that I'm going to be working with them much more closely is that they are a global network they, these guys have got feet on the ground in I'm going to get this number wrong 75 countries Sorry? That's it. 75 countries, 82 member organizations. Now, one of the great, that's a great joy. The downside of that is trying to communicate fairly basic ideas in a way that doesn't cause confusion. I mean, you know, we all know the arguments around child abuse images, child sex abuse material, child pornography, uh, bullying. There's a whole range of terms that some of us use constantly that actually don't translate into some languages at all. Uh, the concept is, is a very difficult one to express and it's a constant sort of barrier and it always getting in the way of some of the discussions that we all try to have. So one of the project, another of the projects that uh, we're going to try and do and that your involvement or engagement with that will be very welcome. We're still not very clear how, how we're going to do it, but we're definitely going to give it a go, is to develop a lexicon that we can publish. So essentially anywhere in the world, if people want to engage in a debate, there will be at least one authoritative reference point that people can look to to get some clarity about some of the concepts that we're, we're going to be, be using. So there are a number of the concrete ideas um, that ECPAT International wants to propose. Um, we're not saying, we're not asking for a vote or for anybody to sort of start saying yes or no now. Think about it. We're going to be in touch with you all uh, in one way or another. And uh, we think it's a great way to go. And next year, when we meet, we'll be selling tickets at the door uh, for people to get in. And we'll have to insist on the plenary uh, room anyway, because that's the way it's going to be from now on, isn't it, Anja? Absolutely. OK, thanks. Thank you so very much, John. And I think that was very invigorating and giving us a newer um, thoughts to, to explore and move forward with. And um, I uh, thank you for that. Um, what um, we would like to do now is, you know, if anyone around the room uh, has any comment to this idea, the proposition that we have. Uh, I certainly know that, you know, uh, Jacqueline and Kim 
would be definitely interested in, uh, you know, uh, you are working on the education and awareness bit, but in terms of the photo DNA that um, John mentioned, uh, it's a technology contribution uh, to this effort. So uh, any ideas that uh, you as a member of the coalition can put forward um, to, uh, to advance this uh, in, in your own capacity, in the way that you are linked to the, uh, to the work, uh, would be very much welcome. Um, and um, any uh, format that you can propose to us uh, that works in terms of exchange, in terms of uh, you know, maybe an online platform, maybe um, setting up a format, a structure that you know, it's, we don't have to wait until the next year's IGF to come and say, okay, well, this is what we thought um, regarding the, your proposition last year. I think what we can all agree on is if you think this is really a good idea, if this is something that we need to do um, to express your thoughts and opinion uh, either now or you know um, offline. So um, we, we really would value your engagement, and we can only do it collectively. Uh, we we need the support of all the members here. So it's just a, um, an appeal. Um, and as John mentioned, uh, next year we probably would have um, a way to um, even before we come, uh, we can identify um, other issues that we need to plug into this. Uh, um, one of the things that we always struggle is how do we make our voice within this room visible um, to the overall, you know, participants here at the forum, right? We know we are being transcribed. This will appear in the publication um, probably six months later, and probably 0.01% of the participants will have a chance to read it. Um, so. We do really want to make a difference to this coalition. You know, the reason why you are here, you are all very, very prominent members um, of the, you know, of the coalition, and you are very, very prominent members of the world in terms of the work that you do. So uh, what the urge here is to how do we make the participation here count, and uh, to make a difference. You know, so uh, and that's an appeal from us as the, you know, the chair. And um, so I, I see your hand, um, Pritam, so if you can share your thoughts. Just a general thought, uh, Anjan. Uh, we are uh, making the uh, ITU COP initiative page as a platform, a repository for sharing information and also uh, sharing tools, of course. So uh, uh, we would be happy to make that available to the uh, Dynamic Coalition and the COP uh, partners. Thanks. For, for that kind offer, and we will definitely explore. And these are the kind of uh, you know contributions each member can bring in and offer, uh, both in terms of the experience, in terms of the resources, uh, even you know uh, when we go back, how do we take this issue to our uh, own governments, for example, you know because. It has to be replicated. It has to be um, reflected uh, in, in in the work that we do. So um, I think uh, we had uh, yes, Jutta. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up that point uh, regards how do we convince our local governments, our national governments, to put more resources into the work of law enforcement. I think that's also worth to have a little bit exchange about that topic, but that maybe could not take place on, on an online platform. It must be more like a personal chat to each other because um, uh, I think it's not the problem that the government uh, understands that there are more resources needed for law enforcement, but once they say officially there are more resource, uh, resources needed, that would be admitting that there have been not enough resources put into law enforcement in the previous time, and that could not be done in the public or officially. So it needs a little bit of diplomatic <laughs> exchange, maybe, and that could also be point of an exchange to learn about the approaches, the strategies that have been used in, in other countries. Certainly a very important strategy for us was getting the police to tell us the truth. Right? Without the truth, your hands, you're hobbled, right? We have a legal system, and mo I think mo 
is there any country here that doesn't have an official system for requiring public authorities to disclose information? We call it the freedom of information uh, provision. So if, the police, if you don't know the truth about what's going on in your country, it's very hard to go to the government you know, and just say, hey, we need more. Everybody, anybody and everybody can say that. Um, yeah. Otherwise, you need to develop your resources inside the police service to get, to get the information out. Uh, uh, just to respond to John, uh, not m many countries uh, in the developing uh, region has this Freedom of um, uh, Inform Information Act that forces uh, the authorities to release the information to the public. And but definitely, uh, where to Germany go? Germany does. Yes, Gerald Tutor did say. Uh, any any questions? Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, Anjan, and thank you all the panelists for some great information, which is definitely complementing a lot of the efforts that we have underway right now at Microsoft. Just a few weeks ago, we had a visit from CIOP, the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Center in the UK. So I'd just like to add a couple of statistics uh, to the record and to what John said. In addition to the 50,000 UK-based individuals currently thought to be involved in sharing indecent images of children, they also talked about 4 million indecent images found in the collection of just one offender in 2002. And they also talked about 424 child victims in a single case earlier this year. So that just goes to underscore the, the, the level of the problem that we're talking about here. What I can offer from Microsoft is we have, uh, as John mentioned, our photo DNA technology. We have a one pager, what we call uh, available online for those who are not familiar with the technology and how you can evangelize it and hopefully use it within your countries or within various organizations. Uh, if you would like that link, we can certainly provide it. I'm also saying that we are always looking for new applications and ways to extend and advance the photo DNA technology, so please um, share with us any ideas that you might have in that regard. I can speak for my colleagues in the Digital Crimes Unit who uh, own that technology, are responsible for that technology. And finally, from a measurement perspective, this is something I'd like to put out to, to all of you on the panel. We have something that Kim and I directly control called the Microsoft Computing Safety Index. And it's a, a gauge of consumer online habits and practices at the technical level, at something beyond the technical level, and then at something at the behavioral and sort of information level. We do this survey every year in 20 countries. And since we control that directly, we're wondering if there is any particular question or item that we could ask people on a regular basis about child protection. We would love to get that in there so we can track and measure these statistics on an annual basis. So please think about that and let us, let us know what we might be able to uh, in, inject directly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. I, I think that's very, very interesting and we would definitely be looking at that. Um, Can I just, yes, please. Yeah, just a quick point about uh, countries where they don't have a Freedom of Information Act. Unless, unless uh, you know, there are ways of getting information other than that. But Here's the point. If you walk around this conference, you see everywhere uh, people talking about the next billion internet users. They're going to be primarily in the developing world. So, all, and, and all of the evidence suggests that the problems that we've seen in the West and in the nor Northern Hemisphere and so on will, will, will start to occur in those countries as broadband uh, access begins to take off. But the the potential for it to do harm is obviously greater in countries where the infrastructure available to law enforcement in terms of, and the infrastructure in terms of social services and the educational and awareness aspects of this, is, it's just a huge, hugely different. And therefore the potential for harm is that much greater. So one possible uh, way, if we can establish some numbers and some metrics on a global level that the UN and various international institutions accept are broadly accurate, that's going to help in any of, the, any of the other countries where they haven't got concrete information from their own national police services. I absolutely agree with you, John, because in all my conversations with governments in the Asia region, uh, they'll all ask me, you know, what's the scope and extent of the issue in our country, and I have no data.
Um, yes. Um, is there any question from the floor? Any more question from the floor? Okay. Yes, I would uh, pass the floor to uh, Susie for her comments, please. Um, in relation to um, supporting and resourcing the police, I think one of the one of the slightly worrying things that's coming out now particularly in the UK, is that there seems to be the answer to every single problem seems to be, well, why isn't industry paying for it? And, you know, every single time you get a politician or, you know, looking at the issue, they say, well, well, industry should be giving them more. You know, Microsoft have got loads of money and Facebook have got loads of money and all the rest. And actually, it's really important to be clear about what is police business and what isn't police business and, and what the police, what should be funded properly directly from government and what shouldn't. And I think that's becoming a bit of a worrying trend in the UK. But John might. OK, yeah, that's a very, very relevant comment, Susie. Um, I think uh, with that, uh, we have uh, closed right on time. Um, and um, thank you all for your participation. Uh, we look forward to staying engaged. Uh, unless uh, Bindu has a closing comment. I just wanted to highlight one thing. When uh, John said, let's not talk about the dark side. If I can skip back about three or four slides. No, can, just, you know, just can I intervene? What he said was, uh, I, I mean, just to No, the on the peer-to-peer -peer exchange, yes. and you know, we're not talking about Dropbox. I just have one thing that I want to highlight. Uh, the Asia-Pacific uh, Coalition, that's the last one. That one. That's it. Thanks, John. Uh, in the last year, I ran a technology challenges work stream within the coalition in Asia. We had five uh, industry partners work with us, and we've just, in the last two weeks, put out a best practices to help file sharing and file hosting companies fight the distribution of child sexual exploitation content. So he really tried to put together, it's a, it's a short 10-page document, just to put together industry thoughts around how can we deal with this issue. So I just wanted to talk about it. It is a first, it's a start, so it is out there and it's available on our website. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Bindu. Yeah. And uh, I, I think we did what John alluded to is that we do cover step by step and uh, first things first. But we do know that these are emerging issues that we do need to get into. And thanks for sharing that information. Yeah, that's, you know, I just wanted to say that we've taken a stab at it. Yes. So that's a start. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so with that, we close the session. And thank you very much all for your participation. Thank you. Uh, uh, before you all leave, I just um, you know, want to um, acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, Janita. Um, Janita Upata is our Deputy Director for Programs, who I probably have already met uh, individually, but just wanted to acknowledge her uh, presence today um, um, as uh, the, you know, the Senior Manager from ECPAT International, uh, because all the discussions that we are having here will actually help us to formulate uh, our own programs and strategize it. So it's very, thank you for coming, Janita, and uh, spending your time with us. Thank you. <laughs>